this series, Change Your World in 52 Days. I'm excited about it because, like I said, I know that God has put something inside of you that you're supposed to be solving a problem. And, and so we're going to discover that and see what the Word of God has to say about you and I doing what God's called us to do, making a difference in this world. Now, here's the good news, is that when I say something like that, that, man, you're special, something, there's something in you that can change things. Maybe you've never really believed that about yourself. Maybe you've never thought that about yourself. And, and that's okay because God wants to use you. In fact, even if you were voted like most popular, you were homecoming king or queen, or you were the star athlete, you know, you got all the trophies, God can still use you too. The thing is, though, is that God often uses the marginalized. God uses the, the person that people don't think of as being the leader. God looks at those people, the, the least likely, and God raises them up to do great things because it's not about how good they are. It's about how great he is. And, and if you question, am I good enough? Probably not. And that's a good thing because God wants to use you because it's not about you being good. It's about God being great and his power at work in your life doing something great. And the story of Nehemiah, this uh, book of the Bible, is probably one of my favorite stories through Scripture because it just captures the heart of what someone can do when they're passionate about making a difference. And, and so we're going to read this, one of the most amazing stories in Scripture about Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, he wasn't a priest. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't the pastor. He didn't have a title. He was a normal, ordinary guy. He was just a dude with a job. Maybe you should have a job. You should be doing something productive. And then, God, like, if you're lazy sitting on the couch, no, God will probably pass over. But, but this is just a normal, average, ordinary dude with a job. And his job was a wine taster. Now, some of you, that, that interests you, right? <laughs> like, right there, you're like, oh. Oh, really? So, so, so like you're going to have a bunch of beer this week and say, God, use me. It doesn't quite work like that. But, but this is the thing, <laughs> is that you're like, Oktoberfest, yay! Okay, so here's the thing. I'm on Facebook. I see what you're doing. So here's the thing. Here's the thing, is that, that this ordinary guy, he was a wine taster. He is a cup bearer to the king. Now, now, some of you are like, that sounds like a good job, right? All I do is drink, you know? But, but here's the thing, is you would die if someone's trying to kill the king. And so, so maybe you're thinking that's a good job. Not so much, right? Because people want to kill the king, and you're like, you're like the, the shield. Like, like they have to get through you to get to the king? Yeah, sorry for you. But, but here's the thing is that his, that's his job, which means he's expendable, okay? Like, 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 like they find someone that if he dies, it's okay, right? right? We'll replace him with someone else. And so that's Nehemiah's job. He's a cupbearer. He tastes the wine before the king gets it to make sure nobody's poisoned it. And so this is the ordinary guy, not a priest, not a pastor, not a leader, not, not some prophet of God speaking truth, is a normal dude with a job. And God looks at him and says, that is who I want to use to change the course of history. And, and I find that encouraging because I see, I, I see in myself shortcomings. You probably look at yourself and you see shortcomings and say, could God really use me? Sometimes I'll say, God, the, the vision that you've given, the call that you've put on us to, to create a, a Ovation Church as a pastor, a church that represents you, that draws people to God, that changes a city, that, that thousands and thousands of people's lives are, are, are affected and, in, and connected to you in a real life-giving way. Are you sure? Like, like I question that sometimes about myself, and, and maybe you do too. Not, not about me. You question it about you. And, and, and maybe you wonder, God, is it really, are you really going to use me? And, and the answer is yes. Yes, God wants to use you. So we're going to look at this story it's about uh, Nehemiah, the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. And uh, it starts in Nehemiah chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 1. And most of this, well, especially all that we're reading today, is actually his personal diary. It's his journal. And we have record of it that has lasted through centuries, that has lasted through time. And this is actually, we're reading his diary, his personal journal. And so Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1 says, The words of Nehemiah, son of... Now, if you're pregnant right now and you're carrying a male child... Um, 
I wouldn't recommend this as a name, okay? Because I think what happened here is the doctor came in with the birth certificate. He's like, what do you want to name him? One of them sneezed, and the doctor wrote it down. And uh, so the son of Hakaliah. He's like, Hakaliah. And so son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, now, you're, like, if you got your new iPhone update, it, it doesn't have Kislev in it, okay, in the calendar. Um, but, but Kislev is actually October, November. So it's like right now. It's just turning fall. It, it's this new season. So it, it's right now, October, November, in the 20th year. That's the 20th year of the reign of King Artaxerxes. While I was there in the citadel of Susa, now that means it's the capital city of the Babylonian Empire. That's what that means. This is modern-day Iran. So this is where he's at. In verse 2, it says, Hananiah... One of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and we'll talk about that in a second, explain that, and also about Jerusalem, the capital city of that area. The, 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 uh, Jesus would have pointed to this city and said that, Christians, you should be a city on the hill, referring to Jerusalem, this beacon of hope, this light to the world, and so he's asking what about Jerusalem? And Jerusalem is special. And we'll uh, look at this a little bit, but Jerusalem is so important and special throughout history. It, it, ancient world, uh, pre-Jesus, uh, the beginning of the world, Jerusalem is important. Current day, Jerusalem is important. You know, in the future, Jerusalem is important. There's something about Jerusalem. God made it special. And, and so he's asking about Jerusalem. Verse 3, they said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are doing, are, are in great trouble and disgrace. Some, some translations say they're in embarrassment. That, that is just a, a disgrace. It's an embarrassment how they're living and what's going on there. It says the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. So let me talk to you a minute about Jerusalem, the importance of this. And, and if you were Nehemiah hearing this information, the importance of it is something along the lines of this. Jerusalem, like I said, in ancient, ancient history has always been important, played a big role. It all, actually all, it starts with way before there was a Jerusalem with Moses. You know, the Moses, Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston. Yeah, so, so it starts all the way back then. The children of Israel are in captivity. Moses is called to lead them out of captivity. And where does he lead them to? Where is Moses called to bring them to? The promised land. Maybe you've heard about the promised land. Why is it called the promised land? Because God promised it. You know, like if, if I promise to give you a car, and then I, I work for it, I work hard, I earn up the cash, I pay cash for it because you shouldn't really borrow money, especially a car you're giving away. So, 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 so you pay cash for it, and I promised you a car, right? And, and so months go by, me working hard, I'm doing everything I can, I finally get this car, I'm like, here's your promised car, right? Because I promised it. And so that's the promised land, God promised it. And so, so Moses takes children of Israel out of captivity, leads them to the promised land. And you know some of the story along the way, right? The pillar of fire, pillar of smoke, leading them, like armies trying to attack them. They get drowned in the sea. You know, you, you've heard a lot of this. You, you remember the part where the Ten Commandments, right? Like lightning bolts out of the sky, write Ten Commandments. It's the finger of God writing the Ten Commandments on these tablets to establish God's law and God's will for people. And, and so all of that's happening. And, and along that way, Moses creates the tabernacle. You've probably heard of the tabernacle. In the tabernacle, the purpose of the tabernacle was for this group of people, God's people, to be able to join together, to gather together, to worship God. They, they were actually the first portable church. You know, we, we think we're doing something new here. No, we're not. Like, like, like way back when, Moses was the first portable church. If they had the rec center, they would have met there. They didn't, so they built a tent, okay? And so this tent would go with them, and they'd set up and tear down. They'd load it in their trailer and pull it with the Dodge, right? That's what they would do. And, and so and, and Dodge was the name of their donkey, apparently. So, so here's the thing. I, so, so here's the thing is that, that they, they built this tabernacle, this, this tent, this portable church, to worship God. And that went on for years and centuries and generations of them coming together in this tent, tabernacle, and worshiping 
God. So, so it ends up where Moses leads them to the promised land. You know the story. Moses doesn't actually go in because he made mistakes and all that. They get to the promised land. They start building a city. They start building walls around it. And this is a couple generations going by. They establish Jerusalem, and they build walls around it. And they build walls around it because in that day, if you didn't have walls, you weren't a city. If you didn't have walls, you had no control over your life. If you had no walls, you were a slave to some other country. Because if an army came in, you could not defend, you could not do anything. The walls were life and death. The walls determined whether or not this group of people could worship God. Because if they didn't have walls and armies attacked them, they would be plundered, they would be stripped clean, they would be killed, they'd be uh, sold into slavery. The, the walls protected them to enable them to worship God. Now, in that city and in the walls, they set up, guess what, the tabernacle and the tent and were worshiping God. And it was this Christian community, you could say, this Jewish people that loved God, believed God, had a relationship with God, were gathering together, worshiping God, protected in this place. And through history and what God says and what Bible talks about, and Jesus even weeps over the condition of Jerusalem because Jerusalem is the city of God for the people of God. And it's supposed to be this example to the world of if you obey God, if you live for God, if you're in relationship with God, this is what life could be like. And it was supposed to be this beacon of hope. It was supposed to be the city on the hill. It was supposed to be the example of God's blessing and love in someone's life, that this is what life could be like if you were in relationship with God. That is what it said. To the rest of the world, to the, to the pagan world, to the heathen world, to, to those that were worshiping false gods, something was supposed to be different about Jerusalem, that when we love God, serve God, worship God, honor God, life is better. It goes well for us. And that was the hope of Jerusalem, this example of what a relationship of, with this God of heaven is like. And, and so that's the importance of it. And, and so they had the wall. They had, they had the tabernacle in there, the tent. Well, you've heard of King David, who, one of the most famous, one of the most uh, prominent kings of that time. Well, he built himself this massive castle, temple, or uh, home, and, and it was huge and it was impressive. And after a little while, he felt guilty because he built himself this amazing home, but they're still worshiping God in the tent. And so he said, this can't be. I'm going to build the greatest temple to worship God to, so that we can gather together and do something amazing and worship God and live this life before him. So, so he gets all the material. He starts the plans for it and everything. But God tells him, you're not going to do it. Your son's going to do it. And, and, and so David gets everything ready. And then Solomon, David's son, then takes over the reins and begins building this temple. They build this amazing, impressive temple to worship God at Jerusalem, protected in the walls so that they could honor God with their lives and not be overrun and taken as slaves or hostages. That is the meaning and the significance of Jerusalem. Generations go by with that as the state, as the state that they lived in, I think somewhere around almost 400 years, that's the case. They're, they're worshiping God and they're living uh, lives that honor God up until a point to when they have some really bad kings that they forget to honor God, they forget to worship God, they, they, they start disobeying God, that they push back from God, they rebel, and the Babylonian empire comes in, wipes it out, and takes it. It takes actually nearly everyone captive. They take everyone captive, and they pull them out, and they exile them. And now they're slaves. The walls are burned down, they're torn down, the gates are burned down, the temple's destroyed. Their way of life, their way to honor God, it's done. Well, then about 50 years later, the Babylonian king at that time, the leader, which was about two generations, 50 years, the, the leader then said some of the Jews can go back, the ones that were exiled. So they go back and they rebuild the temple. The first thing they do is they rebuild the temple to worship God. And, and then uh, it's about another hundred years after that, that we read the story of Nehemiah. So get the picture of this. In Nehemiah's day, Nehemiah would have been one of those exiled people from generations past now living in the Babylonian controlled area, the, the, actually the capital of the Babylonian empire in Susa. It's been 150 years since Babylonia, ba the Babylonians destroyed 
Jerusalem. And he says, hey, how's it going back there? Some of the exiles that are returned, how's it going? And his brother and the friends, they say, it's, it's not good. It's a disgrace. It's an embarrassment. The walls are down. The gates are torn down. And it's not going well for them. And this is, this is amazing. This is what happens. This is what happens in verse 4. After he hears that, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. Okay. It's been 150. This isn't new news. You know, this isn't like breaking news, like CNN, Fox News, or whoever. This isn't like, like the uh, app that sends you like uh, instant alerts as soon as something happens. This news is old news. This has been the condition for 150 years. We're talking six generations. The walls have been down. The gates have been burned. Nothing's changed. But Nehemiah feels something today that he's never felt before. And I just want to pause right here because this is what I believe, and this is what I want you to get from this part of the story, is that there's something that's been the way it is in your life for too long. There's something that you've been living with in your life, in your family, in your community. There, there, there's something that is wrong, and you've lived with it as normal. And, and you've not seen it for what it is because you've just said it's always been that way. It will always be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. For 150 years, six generations, my great-grandpa, my great-great-grandpa, the, the, for as long as I can remember, this is the way it's always been. But this day... Something changed in Nehemiah, and my prayer is that something will change in you, that whatever has been normal, whatever you've accepted, that you'd see it through new eyes, and that you would begin to feel it like Nehemiah felt it, and you would say, this isn't okay, and something must be done about it. Because when you start to get that attitude, that's the first glimmer of hope that you have to start changing something. You've got to recognize it and see it. So this is the thing, is that the walls are down, it's an embarrassment. And Nehemiah, finally, for whatever reason, God's providence, choosing him to do something about it, he starts to care. And when it says that he wept, and he fell down, and he weeps, this actually probably went on somewhere around three to four months of him weeping and being distraught about the condition of Jerusalem. For four months, it affected him. You know, that, that basically, that, that'd be like me saying, hey, I got some bad news to tell you this morning. Um, I don't know how you're going to take this. don't know how you're going to react. You might should get some tissues ready. President Abraham Lincoln was shot. Right? That's like 150 years ago. Now, now, your response, like Nehemiah's response, would be for the next four months, you like have an emotional breakdown. Okay? And so that's, the, that's what's going on with Nehemiah, but he cares so deeply about what's going on. And this is what Nehemiah knew about the situation, is that this wasn't even about just the walls. The people there had accepted it. And it was about the people's hearts, and it was about the people's attitudes, and it was about their outlook in life and their vision for life had to change because the people in Jerusalem had grown up that way and had walked over the rubble, they had walked over the stones, but none of them had ever risen up to do anything about it, and that had to change. And so it wasn't even about Nehemiah saying, I'll go build a wall. Nehemiah saying, I'm going to have to go, and I'm going to have to change people's hearts to get them to care. I'm going to have to change the people so that the people can then build the walls. And that's what starts with, with you. If you're going to change something around you or in your family, if God's putting a burden on you to say, hey, something needs to be done about this, let me, you're going to have to change before that can change. You can't just rush off and start doing something. Something in you is going to have to change. And my prayer is that God begins to spark something in you today that hasn't been there before and that you begin to care like you've never cared before. Your heart breaks for what breaks God's heart and you begin to care and you go after to change something. So I want to talk about three things these three qualities, you could say, these three, three, three attitudes that you're going to have to have. If you're going to be an ordinary world changer, these three things need to be present in your life. And like I said, God is looking for ordinary people, ordinary, regular people, a dude with a job, a gal with a job. God's looking for ordinary people to do something amazing 
and extraordinary. And these are some of the things that you're going to have to do in order as an ordinary person to then step into what God is calling you to do with your life. Number one is sit down to cry. Sit down to cry. Now, that sounds strange. It's like, no, I want to go do. No, sit down and cry. We see that with Nehemiah. When he hears this news, he falls down and he weeps. And what that means is that for the first time possibly in his entire life, he cared enough to let it affect him. And I do this, and I know you've done this many a times, is so often we see things that are bad. We see things that should change. And we say, oh, someone should do something about that. Oh, that's, that's, that's bad. I'll like the post. Yeah, feed the children. Oh, yeah, like. And then you go on with your, you, you don't really care. In fact, if I can be honest for a minute, I, 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 I would rather send someone 10 bucks than to really care. You know? right, right? I mean, the, the, Angela and I, we were out at a store and we were shopping and we came out to the car and somebody was walking across the street. You could tell that they were either uh, homeless or somewhere in a bad state in life. And, and this guy and this gal were together and they, they're walking over and they come up and they tell us their story and things have been hard for them. And, and they say, do you have any money? Can, can we have any money? And depending on the situation, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'll offer to buy them a gift card to somewhere to go eat or something. But, but this time I felt like I should give them some money. And, and so I pull it out. I give them all the cash I had, like 16, 17 bucks or something. And I give it to them and then they go on their way. And, and I never really even let it affect me. I was like, yeah, here, here, have some cash, here, there you go. And then Angela and I keep shopping. Just go on with our day. And I was just thinking, how often do we do that in life where we see a problem, we see pain, we see suffering, we see something that shouldn't be? And we might, you know, throw some money at it. We might click a like button or share a status to let more people know, but we don't ever actually feel it. We don't actually ever care about it. And if you're really going to be passionate about what God has put in your life to change, you're going to have to have some emotion and some passion. You've got to be willing to just sit down and cry, to see something that shouldn't be the way that it is, and to care enough to allow it to affect you. And if, you, if you've never been to that point, I pray that God would move in your life where you'd see something so deeply that you would cry. I remember the first time uh, I went back to Albania um, recently, uh, a few years ago, about five years ago. I'd been when I was 14, and at 14, you see things a little differently than you do when you're about 30. And, and so I went about five years ago to Albania, and I just cried the whole time. I cried for the state of the people there and, and the children that don't get fed, and I, and I cried for the education system that's broken, and, and, and their answer to everything is, you have a problem, you got mental problems here. Be locked away for the rest of your life, and... and Dads are pulled away from families that really didn't have that many problems, but yet they say they're mental, and so they feed them drugs, and they ruin their life. And I cried over this stuff. I cried over the story that the church there told me about the lady that owed taxes and thought it was hopeless and committed suicide because she owed $1,200 in taxes. And I cried. And if you've never had something in your life, that you're willing to cry about, that you care about, that you say something is not right here, then you're going to go through life and you're going to miss what God has called you to change. When we see suffering, when we see pain, when we see something that is wrong, we've got to be willing to embrace that suffering, to embrace the pain, to actually feel it. Because that's going to give us the passion to do something about it. If we brush it off, if we don't let it actually really get in our hearts like that, we're never going to change it. we got to be willing to sit down and cry. That's what Nehemiah did. What, what is it that bothers you? I think some of you in here, some of you in here, you've got those things that irritate you. Maybe some of you, you maybe you don't cry about something, but maybe you get mad, right? Like you get angry. You hear about an injustice, you hear about something that shouldn't be, and it makes you mad. Okay, then embrace that and then be angry and sin not, is what Scripture says. Anger is a great emotion. It's a great motivator. You, you should see something that's uh, uh, unjust. You should see something that, that shouldn't be, and you should get angry about it. And then you should go do something about it. But, but what is it with you that annoys you? Let me, let me ask you. Think about this with your family, with your life, with, with what you've experienced, with what you've seen. What is it 
that irritates you? What is it that you see an injustice that you say, something has to be done about this? Maybe for some of you, you see bullying in your school. Some of you students, and you say, people shouldn't be treated like that. Then, then care about that. Don't just see it and say, hey, someone should do something about that. Well, maybe for some of you, it, it, it's some cause like abortion. I, I know here in uh, Burleson, there's Jane Burton that runs the Pregnancy Aid Center. She has such a passion for, for people that have gone through abortions or are considering abortions to step in and share God's love with them. And it's amazing the work that they're doing because she feels it. And she's been where they've been. And she's allowed it to affect them. Well, what is it for you that you would stand up and say, this isn't right and I care too much to just sit by and you're angered by it or you cry about it and you let it affect you? What is it for you? What is it for you? Number two, kneel down to pray. Kneel down to pray. Nehemiah 1.4. He says that he fell down and he wept. And then it says, for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Before the God of heaven. He, he, he falls down, he weeps, and he cries about it. But he doesn't just leave it there. And for some of you, there's something that irritates you. There's something that bothers you. You see an injustice, and you complain about it, or you say it shouldn't be, and you, you cry. Maybe there's some heart, uh, some heartache in your life, so some pain from your life, and so it makes you want to cry, and you say it's not fair. And you've got to get past that, and you've got to then pray about it. You've got to move past just the complaining and saying something's wrong. You've got to move past that and say, okay, God, what is it that you have for me to do? So he began to pray about it. He knelt down to pray. And maybe what bothers you, and, and I hope that this is the case, I hope that God puts something in your life that is so big, that is bigger than you, that is more than you can handle, that you would look at it and say, what could I possibly do about that? I pray that it is God's plan for your life intimidates you. That you would say, is it even possible to change this? And I pray that that would drive you to this conclusion that with God, it is possible. That it might be very difficult, it might be hard, it may look or seem impossible to change your marriage or your finances or uh, relational issues within your family or something that's going on in your community or, or the way that your uh, school is operated. You students, you, you may see that and say, what can one person do? It's not one person. You kneel down and you pray and it's God plus you. And when it's you plus God, you're the majority. It doesn't matter what you're facing, doesn't matter what you're going through, doesn't matter how difficult it is, doesn't matter how the walls have been torn down, the gates have been burned, how impossible it looks, how, how, how embarrassed it may be, God and you can change it. If you're facing something in life right now, it's not about how good you are, it's about how great God is. When you involve God, you become the most powerful force in that situation. Let me say that again. When you involve God, whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, whatever dream you have in life, to do something for this, in this world for God's purposes, as soon as you involve God, you become the most powerful force in that situation. God can work through you to change things in your family, in your life, and in the community. You kneel down to pray. You plus God is the majority. This, I love this about Nehemiah. Look, look at what Nehemiah does. Now, so often when we pray, we don't pray like Nehemiah prays, okay? Because so often when we pray, we go to God and we pray with this kind of attitude. Maybe you've done this before. You, you go to God and you pray because you're trying to convince God to agree with you, right? Or, or you pray, you come to God and you pray to try and convince him that something should change. Or you come to God and say, like, God, this is really bad and this and that. And, but, but, but Nehemiah does something completely different. Prayer is not going to God trying to convince God of something. That is not prayer. What Nehemiah does is he prays and he prays to agree with God. Get that. He doesn't pray to try and convince God. He prays so that he agrees with God. Because this is what he says in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse nine, 8 and 9. The, this first word is huge. He says, remember, Nehemiah, speaking to God, says, God, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses. What, what was the instruction he gave to Moses? Moses, take my people out of captivity and take them to the promised land so that you can have a place to worship me. 
And Nehemiah brings that into it. Nehemiah prays and says, God, remember what you said. And this is what needs to happen in your life and in my life, is that when we see a problem in the world, when we see heartache in the world, when we see uh, suffering in the world, that we don't just rise up and say, hey, I'll do something about this and I'm going to get with it. We got to say, okay, I recognize that this is wrong because God has called it to be different than it is. And when I go and I serve and I try and change this, I'm not doing it because I think it should change. I'm doing it because God said it should change. I'm doing this because I'm already agreeing with what God has called to be different. And that is true in your life. And, and where your marriage is concerned, where your finances are concerned, where your job is concerned, maybe some of you are uh, uh, self-employed or maybe some of you are business owners or entrepreneurs, God has called you to a certain life. God has, God has called you to live a certain way. And, and, and for you to look at life and say, you know, these things don't add up with what God has already said. So when I pray, I'm going to agree with what God has already said to change these things. It's not you convincing God to do something different. That's huge. So this is what he says. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. And that's what happened. They were unfaithful. Babylonians came in and destroyed them. It says, but, say but. You got to do louder than that. Like, like say it with some attitude. Say but. Here's the thing is that you've been living a certain way. You've been putting up with something, but your parents went through this. Your great-grandparents went through this. Your aunts and uncles have done this. Okay, but something can be different for you. So, so the but is huge. And so, 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 so verse 9, it says, but if, so, so no matter what it's been, no matter what you've suffered, no matter what it's been through, but if you return to me and obey my commands, then even your exiled people who are on the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. God says, this Jerusalem area, is it's a chosen place for my name. Now, now, Nehemiah is repeating that to God. This is something God had said previously. And Nehemiah repeats it to God and says, this thing that I see that is wrong is not just in and of myself that I don't like it, but God, this is something that you've called to be different. What is it in your life that God has called to be different that you've lived with as normal? What is it that you've put up with that, that, that if you were to ask God, God, how do you want this in my life? What is it that doesn't line up with what God wants? I want to challenge you. Start to feel that pain of that. Start to embrace the tension that that will create. Because when you can do that, when you feel it and you say, God, this is not right because you've called it to be different, then you can stand up and ask God to work through you to change it and to do something about it. What is it in your life? that God has called to be different. You know, one, one of those things, God has spoken so highly of the church, and even the story of Nehemiah and the, 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 the area of Jerusalem and the tabernacle and the temple and a place for God's people to worship God and to learn about God and, and to live in a way that honors God and encourage each other. That's a picture even of the church today. And, and God has spoken about the church and the impact that the church should make. And, and I got to tell you, even with Ovation Church, there's things that I see that bother me, that, that, that I it sometimes want to cry about because I care, and, and I say it shouldn't be this way. What is it with you that you would see and say it shouldn't be this way? God has called it to be different. Just begin to agree with God, recognize it for what it is, and start doing it. You know, this is, uh, real quickly before I move on, this is something that amazes me. <laughs> is this issue of praying to, you know, agree with God so often, I've been guilty of this before, probably because I just didn't want confrontation. You've probably done it before, and you just didn't want to have confrontation at the moment. And, and, and we throw out this phrase, I'll pray about it. Right, right. Like that's the Christian thing to say when you don't want to say no, right? And so, so instead of just looking someone square in the face and saying no, you say, I'll pray about it. Well, aren't you spiritual? Good for you. So here's the thing, is that 
Some things, like, like, like we say, yeah, I'll pray about it, but really what you're saying is no, or what you're saying is I'm going to try and convince God that I don't really have to do that, because you're going to pray and say, God, don't you have something different in my life for that? No. But, but here's the thing is, uh, even in Ovation Church, I've asked people, hey, would you serve? Would you volunteer? We, we need help with setup crew. We need, we, we need uh, uh, help in the children's department. Opportunities to influence people's lives. Opportunities to love a community. Opportunities to stand up and declare the truth of the gospel. Would you help us? I'll pray about it. <laughs> Here's the thing. Is, what do you got to pray about? Just agree with what God has already said because God has said he wants to use you to influence people. God has said, I want to establish a church that honors my name. Jesus loved the church so much that he died for it, and you have to pray about whether or not to show up early to serve. What is going on? No, Nehemiah, he prays, but he agrees with what God's already said. And, and, and so in your life, when you're challenged with something that God's already said, do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to throw this out here. Even where your money's concerned, like, like I'll pray about how much to give. Well, well, God's already said you should be giving 10%. Now, you don't have to wonder, like, God, oh, do you want me to give 10%? Yes, he's already said it. You know, you just have to agree with him and then go do it. And his gifts and his power will enable you to then do what he's called you to do. You're trying to do something he's never said to do. You expect him to help you do that. And that's, that's what happens in life in so many areas where you say, God, I want you to fix my marriage. Well, are you being the husband that he's already said you're supposed to be? No, you're being something else, but you're saying, God, help me be something else. No, it doesn't work that way. Agree with what God's already said. When you see something that doesn't line up with what God's called it to be, feel that. Pray to God to change you to agree with him so you can do something about it. That was good preaching. Go ahead and just give God a hand right there. All right, point number three, stand up to act. Stand up to act. Here's the thing. Stop praying at some point and just go do, okay? Because so many Christians, we love to just pray and pray and pray and pray, and then we never do. And we can't do that. We've got to, we pray, we seek God, we ask God to help us accomplish what he's already called us to do, and then we go out and we do. I heard the story of this famous minister. He was in a boat, and the boat gets a leak. And him and his associate were there, and they hear about this leak from one of the crew members. And so the associate turns to the minister and says, I think we should pray. And he says, you go ahead and pray. I'm getting a bucket. <laughs> because so often we want to pray when it's not a time to pray, it's the time to do. And so we need to stand up and act. Stand up and act. Be a part. Listen, this some of you are praying for things to change. Let me just tell you, be a part of the answer that you're praying for. Whatever you're praying for, whatever you want to see change, whatever you want uh, different in your life, in your family's life, uh, maybe in a community, maybe in a nation, the, the change that you're praying for, why don't you be a part of the answer? You stand up and you act. You don't just pray about it. You stand up and you act and you become a part of the answer that you're praying for. Nehemiah uh, chapter 2. So this is the next chapter. What happens, you know, he hears the bad news. He feels it. He prays to God about it for about four months. This is what Nehemiah does. Nehemiah 2 verse 3. He's the cupbearer of the king, so he's got a presence with the king. And he says, but I said to the king, and the king asks him, why are you sad? Because it was obvious on his face after four months of crying, he had puffy eyes, right, ladies? Uh, so something was going on. The king looks at him and is like, dude, you look bad. You need some sleep. And, and he's like, what's wrong with you? And, and so he says to the king, may the king live forever. Now, if you're going to ask something of the king, let me just throw it out there. Give him wine and then compliment him. And so he says to the king after giving him wine, he says, may the king live forever. And then he says, why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Six generations have passed since then. The king knows exactly what he talks about. Guess this king, King Artaxerxes, is the king of the Babylonian Empire, who invaded Jerusalem 150 years earlier and trampled the uh, wall and burned the gates. Babylonian Empire. And so he's talking, you know what your great-great-great-great-grandpa did? Um... I'm really sad about that. So that's what he tells uh, the, the king. And the king said to me, what is it you want? 
that is a powerful question. What if the God of heaven were to look at you and ask you that question? Would you have an answer? Would you just make something up on the spot? What is it that you, what is it that's bothering you? What is it that you want to see change? What is it that you're willing to be involved in and a part of and actually take some action? What is it that you want? And I love Nehemiah. <laughs> Nehemiah's uh, probably wanted to wet his pants. And then, <laughs> but but he says, and I prayed to the God of heaven. It's like um, like heat of the moment. And, and this this even just reveals Nehemiah's prayer life where it was a constant part of his day. It wasn't I pray for 30 minutes in the morning before work and I check it off the box because I did one. No, it's this constant communication with God and seeking God's wisdom. And so, and so the king says, what do you want? And then I prayed to the God of heaven. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried, so that I can rebuild it. He wasn't just going to feel bad about it and say somebody should do something about it. He wasn't just going to pray and say, God, won't this change? He was willing to stand up, put his life on the line, and ask something of the king that could have ordered his death. He was willing to risk it all for something that he was so passionate about seeing changed, that he was willing to risk his life to ask the king, can I please rebuild what your great, 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 great grandpa burned down? Would you give me the favor? Would you, would you give me favor and allow me to do that? This thing is so often, we'll say, this is bad, this is wrong, this is an atrocity, this is an embarrassment for our nation, or this is an embarrassment for our community. Somebody should do something about that. If you've ever thought that, if, if you come across something in life where you see something that's not the way it should be, and you would say somebody should do something about that, I want you to change your mind and say, instead of saying somebody should do something about that, say, why shouldn't it be me? If you've ever thought that, if in the next month, if in the next 10 years, you think somebody should do something about that, follow that with saying, why shouldn't it be me? Because if you see it, if you see something wrong with it, maybe, perhaps maybe it's God's divine touch in your life pointing out something to you that everybody else sees as normal, that everybody else has lived with for their whole life and think that it's the way it should always be, but for a glimpse of a moment, you see it and say, somebody should do something about that. Why shouldn't it be me? And if you do that, I believe that God will begin to use you to change your family. God will use you to change your school, students. God will use Ovation Church to change a community. We'll use a community to change a state. God wants to do something through you. When you see something that says it's not right, somebody should do something about it. We shouldn't take this anymore. It's not okay. It's not normal. Somebody should do something. I should do something about it. And, and it's overwhelming. If you're taking notes... It can get overwhelming, so I, I want to encourage you with this. You can't do everything, but you can do something. You can't do everything, but you can do something. I pray that this burden on your heart to see something that's wrong is bigger than you can handle. It, it, it's intimidating. It's this big nasty, hairy, moly, monster of a project that you would say, where do I even start? What could I ever do? You can't do everything, but you can do something. If you're taking notes, I didn't put this down, but write it down. Do for one what you wish you could do for all. Do for one what you wish you could do for all. You know what? Children that are starving don't have food, even though the world it produces plenty of food to feed everybody, but there's this uh, logistic issue of getting it to everybody and, and corporations involved and greedy people involved and other politicians involved, and it's a mess, and it's horrible that children go without food, that people go to bed hungry, that a $5 shot will cure diseases that children are dying from. It makes no sense. It's wrong. 
We, and me as an individual, I can't do everything. I can't feed every child. But you know what? We can feed some. That's why in Albania, we help children. We give education to children. Why? Because I can't help everybody. But I can help someone. And in your life, you, you might see problems in your life. And you don't even know which problems to pick. Some of you, your, your problem is not that you can't see any. The problem is that you see all of them. And you see all these issues. You see all these problems. You don't know where to start, whether it's your marriage, your finances, your career, whether it's your crazy Uncle Bob or whatever, whatever it may be. You, you see all these issues, all these problems, and you don't know where to start. You can't do everything. You can't do something for everyone. But you can do something for someone. And you can look outside of yourself and you can start to help. Somebody's got to do something. It might as well be me. What's broken in your life? What walls are down in your life? What gates have been burned in your life that you've been accepting, that you've been living with as normal? Somebody's got to do something. It might as well be you. Stop waiting on your spouse Stop waiting on your employer. Stop waiting on the other person to do. You can rise up and you can start making a difference. Now, now this, this story of Nehemiah, the walls being torn down, the gates being burned, them uh, being in a state of uh, embarrassment and disgrace, it was bigger than Nehemiah could have ever handled. But he chose to step up and to believe that God could use him to do something. And I believe that if you make that same choice, that if you would step up, believe that God can do something for, through you, that you would help the needs of someone else. And this is what I want your prayer to be. If you're taking notes, write this down. I, I want this to be our prayer as we close the service. Use me for the needs of others. Use me for the needs of others. Of others. Here's the thing is that Nehemiah could have stayed at the uh, capital city of the Babylonian Empire, lived in comfort, served the king, drunk a bunch of wine. He could have gone on with his comfortable life, but he risked it all for the needs of others. And I pray that your eyes are open to a problem that needs a solution. That, that your eyes are open to suffering, to the heartache, to, to something that doesn't line up to with what God has called it to be, and that you would recognize it, maybe for some of you for the first time ever, and that you would be willing to move out of your comfort zone, to take a step of faith and to risk something, to say it can't be this way, it has to change. God, use me for the needs of others. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this message. And God, I pray that you speak to each and every one of our hearts individually, that our eyes would be open, that we would see the problems that are around us that you've called us to solve. Maybe it's the things that we've been complaining about the most, that instead of complaining, you're asking us to actually do something to fix it. And God, for some in here today, they're overwhelmed and intimidated. Maybe they're even already worn out and they're tired because they've been trying to change something and it's not changing. God, I pray that you would just blow a fresh fire and a fresh wind into their lives, that you would encourage them to fight that fight, that it's worth fighting, that it's worth changing, and to not be discouraged, and to not give up. And that, God, they wouldn't try doing it in their own strength, but they rely on you. And just like Nehemiah prays in agreement with what you have for him and ask for your favor, God, I pray that each and every one of us today that are facing something that we want to see changed, that we would trust you, that we would rely on you, that we would pray in agreement with what you've already said about the situation, and that we would walk out what you've called us to do to change it.